Welcome out to another episode of It's All Been Done Radio Hour. We've got another Meet the Cast for you. It's Nick and Dan again. You may ask yourself, haven't I already heard Nick and Dan's one-on-one Meet the Cast? And you have, except Dick and Dan ask any questions. Nick asked all the questions, which was not the point of how we do these things. So I sent them back to the microphone and made them record again, and this time made Dan do some asking. So I hope you enjoy that very much. Before we begin... I want to thank Circle 270 Media, which this podcast is a part of. We also want to thank the Columbus Podcast Awards, which is coming up on August 25th, 2009, from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Gateway Film Center. It's All Been Done Radio Hour, and a bunch of the podcasts on the It's All Been Done Presents Network were nominated, so you should go to the awards show. We're going to highlight and celebrate great podcast in Columbus, Ohio. It's a family-friendly, free event. Just register at ColumbusPodcastAwards.com, and we hope we see you at the Gateway Film Center there on August 25th. We want to thank Mad Lab Theater. Our next live show is coming up there on Saturday, August 10th, next Saturday. And that's our 50th live show. We're going to find out why Ratcliffe hates Woosley so, so, so very much, his arch nemesis. Uh, that should be fun. We also want to thank It's All Been Numbers Ends, our parent network of podcast, written work, video series, and more. One of the programs on It's All Been Numbers Ends is QBC. That's the quarterly book club. Why quarterly? Because books are long and you're busy. We're doing Young Adult this year. You can already go watch the video discussion for the first two selections, Point Claw by Amber J. Keezer and Looking for Alaska by John Green. They're on our YouTube channel. You can find those links right at IBDPresents.com. We are now reading You Will Know Me by Megan Abbott. And the video discussion of that is going to go live at the end of September. So pick up that book, jump in, join us on this quarterly book club journey. And now enjoy It's All Been Done Radio Hour. I guess the question that comes to mind for me first is, like, I know you're, you're like, really big into cartoons, and yeah. I'm, I know that's really influenced you and your roles and your <laughs> acting here in the show. Yeah. Um, what would you say was the cartoon from your childhood that really, like, stood out as the influence for you to like really get into this like my first thought is Rocky and Bullwinkle just because of no. what you've no right no no, no. Yeah. So, so I would watch that all the time mm-hmm. um, but it, I would say it, the thing that made me so there's two answers but one of them's not a show it's a movie okay so the first Ninja Turtles movie Okay. Michelangelo is doing the impressionations, trying to make everybody laugh. He's like, mm, "You dirty rat! You killed my brother! Mm, <laughs> you dirty rat! Oh no, not Cagney! Anything but Cagney!" Like that whole bit. Yeah, I would start to do, and then I would start to do. Like, at what point did we lose control here? Any thoughts? <laughs> like, yeah, I was doing the lines, and my dad's like, "You sound kind of like them," and I was just like, "Oh, good." So then I started working on my my Stallone, my Cagney, because those are voices that everybody uses. Well, Stallone at the time was still yes but Cagney no and then but the other one I started realizing who does the voices was Animaniacs because I was just like that voice sounds so familiar because I was watching it all the time getting sucked into it Mm -hmm. and I started noticing oh that voice is doing this other voice over here and then it's like oh who does the voice of the classic stuff like and not even Rocky and Boinkle like Hanna-Barbera cartoons yeah because those were more on the air than Rocky and Boinkle like Rocky and Boinkle for me didn't really come on the air like my dad would talk to me about Rocky and Boinkle yeah it was almost like your uncle who doesn't, and no offense to my uncle, but at the time, I, my family's very sports oriented. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, like, he didn't even like movies or TV shows. And so he's like, when you were when he was little, he would like to watch Bullwinkle Moose pull the rabbit out of the hat, and it would never be the rabbit. It'd be a, a moose or whatever. And he would tell me about it. So then I watched it. I was like, on Nickelodeon, Moosarama, like, from 7 to 8. Then mm-hmm. they made it kind of part of Snick. Before it became Nick at Night. Like, that was, like, yeah. the last little thing that would... and. And that was like in high school. That's when I started rocking, watching Rocky and Bullwinkle. But okay. then I would get frustrated because like one night I would have to go to like school something, mm-hmm. and then I would miss what was happening. And even though it's a radio, technically it's a radio play with poor animation done to it, I mm-hmm. still got lost on what was going on, and I would get frustrated. <laughs> or sometimes they would just shift the storyline, uh-huh. so it's almost like they would do three storyline, like storyline Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then another storyline Tuesday, Thursday. So you'd be like metal moon munching mice or whatever and then it's like the banana formula mm-hmm. and then you go back to um, moon, moon uh, I don't know but the, anyway, the, but yeah. the first one yeah the yeah. first one you get to another or, or it would be a third one and you're like what the hell is going on so but yeah surprisingly no it's not Rocky <laughs> Boyle but I would say but Animaniacs like Paul Rob Paulson 
Jess Harnell. And I just remember uh, Jess Harnell, for some reason, like, he seemed new to me in the voice mm-hmm. acting world, because Rob Paulson had been around forever. Um, he did Raphael and Ninja Turtles. I, that's what I, said. So I was like, oh my god, <laughs> I love Ninja Turtles. He was Raphael. And then I was looking, and I was like, but Jess Harnell's barely been in the game. And then I started listening to Tasmania. I was like, that sounds like Jess Harnell, and I ended up being right. So then I became a voice chaser. So it's Animania. So, yeah. Sorry, that's the real answer. <laughs> yeah, I love it. What was your favorite segment on that? It's hard to tell, but... <laughs> <laughs> I liked good idea, bad idea. Mm-hmm. Good idea. Being served breakfast in bed. Bad, bad idea. idea. Being served tennis balls in bed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just something, get, something it's like Mr. that. It's Mr. Skullhead, who is from Elmira and Tiny Toons, that little skull. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. technically what Mr. Skullhead is, and that's how oh. they made him tie together and, like... Yeah, and so yeah. that was always... Like, his head would just, just get, get knocked, knocked off. off right. But, uh, I just... I, I guess I would say that my favorite is always just the good night, everybody's. Good night. Oh, yeah. Because like, that, that typically love, means they did a dirty job. They did, yeah. <laughs> yes. Like, my favorite one is still, I, I believe it was an earlier episode where they're all in class with this real snooty teacher. <laughs> she asks, Yakko, can you conjugate? Me? I've never even kissed a girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Miss Flamio. I, I also, I think the, the big reason I liked Animax, though, is that, so, like, my subset of my dad's side of the family like my dad and I were musical mm-hmm. too so even when my dad played sports he was also really big into music like yeah it just hit all the right like no pun intended it hit all the right notes like literally it, like the songs were catchy mm-hmm. then I realized I was learning something and I was like well that's kind of cool you know so and there's not there was not any other show like that on TV I think to me the closest another show got to that level of interacting children with adult humor just like slyly put into it was mm-hmm. probably the early Spongebob. And see, I I am not well versed on that because that was when I was kind yeah. of in my old man get off my lawn phase with right. a lot of cartoons on Cartoon Network but really Nickelodeon because mm-hmm. I felt when they canceled, um, well the first two times, they canceled like Rugrats or some of the other original Nicktoons yeah. like Rocco's Modern Life. I And back in the day I also really loved John Kay and Ren and Stimpy and then nowadays I can't watch that show at all. I, yeah. It, it's, and it doesn't help as well that he is also a pedophile. Um, which is I did not know that. Oh you know, yeah, uh, oh, no. look it up, folks. I was just going to say it's very sad oh. and very refreshing. But like even back when they brought it back, remember the uh-huh. adult cartoon party or whatever? Yeah, I started rewatching all the old episodes, and outside of the first maybe five episodes of the first season, it doesn't hold up at yeah. all. Like the animation holds up throughout the whole series. Because that is the one thing John K did well was the animation, mm-hmm. or he instilled in his animators the animation. But I, I just. It's almost too gross. Like it's the yeah, and I, that's not me. Like I think we talked about this before. We also like uh, Adult Swim, oh yes. cartoons, and like there oh, yes. sometimes where like Tom goes the mayor I, and Tim and Eric. I do not love those guys. Uh, yeah, I, like, feel I feel the like same. I, yeah, I like, feel like they're gross to be gross and not funny. Yeah, like there was a lot of shows that aired on Adult Swim that I was just like, why the hell is this even on? Like, um, did you do you ever remember a show called Third Ounce Mouse? Okay, I tried watching two minutes of it from the start. Yeah. Like, not the first episode it aired, but I just tried watching it from the beginning of the episode because I was like, it's an adult swim show. Like, right. usually in the first three minutes, you know what's going on, right. and you like it or you don't. And I was like, I don't know what this show is about. It looks like it was drawn by a three-year-old, which is kind of probably the charm, but I'm not I'm not buying it's, it. It's horrible. <laughs> so I yeah. just stopped watching. Well, it's like, okay, it's on adult swim. Surely it's got to have, like, you know, like, funny adult humor, this and that. It was yeah. dull. No, it's no, just dull. Not not to throw a question your way. Don't you feel like that makes you feel like an, an old man, like get off, like yelling at the cloud <sighs> to be Grandpa Simpson? Like back in my day, Adult Swim didn't do shows like yeah. this. They were good shows <laughs> with a talking milkshake and and, and and a ghost from space. The milk wild, the milk wild. Oh, look, the milk wild bottle. I love I love Master Shake. Yeah, uh, that guy. Yeah, to, uh, to watch him record that is just really oh, yeah. bizarre. Um, I've I never know. actually seen it. Uh, there, uh, yeah, well, I've never seen him record it. I've seen, uh, you've I've seen, seen, yeah, obviously, because it's not but, like yeah. it's like that. Or you were doing a great job doing Meatwad with <laughs> no, no, no knowledge of the show. Thank you. <laughs> no, what what is Meatwad? <laughs> uh, Meatwad is a meatball. Um, good, uh, question, good question. Good yes. um, uh, well, I, I created it back in the 1400s. <laughs> One of my favorite bits. I didn't realize it. Literally, I wish I realized it sooner. But I didn't realize it until when I started watching Rocky and Boinkle, like a lot in the last few years, is that they'd always have 
in Fractured Fairy Tales the same set of voices in every uh-huh. one. So the characters would change, but the voices are the same. So it's technically, so technically, like there'd always be a stupid guy who talks like this. Hello, and then there, there would be there would be some ancillary characters, but like mm-hmm. there was always the June Ferre female voice, and it's either the, the old woman who sounds, or, or, you know, like, tw- like a nice old woman, like Tweety, mm-hmm. be a mean old witch that sounds like Witch Hazel. Or, I fucking love Witch oh, Hazel. Witch Hazel is so good. She's so good. But, I mean, it's literally the same voice. Yeah. Um, or she would do a super sexy princess voice. And then and, and then, then there would be, um, oh, God, I feel horrible not knowing who the other voice actor is. Uh, Dolls Butler. He wasn't officially hired to be on the show because he was doing Hanna Barbera mm-hmm. as a conflict of interest, and so he what wasn't. What other voices officially... did he do? Uh, Quick Straw McDraw. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, Huckleberry Hound. Okay. And, and so he has a very particular voice. So he so he would be the voice in Rock and Boinkle and other cartoon shows back then. We're like, what are you talking about? So when we did Rock and Boinkle, you did that voice of the fox. What do you mean? Oh no, over there. <laughs> oh hello, nice shoe size. That, yeah, like. <laughs> yeah. And like, but that voice would always be in one of those episodes, followed by a possible stupid character. Die, gee, I don't know if I. And usually, they were almost all done by Dolls Butler, and maybe every once in a while, uh, Paul Fries, who was Boris. And, okay. Um, and also, I think Paul Fries did like a lot of other. Um, I think he was also the original voice of Ludwig von Drake. I'm feeling very unsure that I said that one, <laughs> but I know for sure Boris bad enough. But he did like a bunch of other stuff, and then. Um, and then Bill Scott, who does Bullwinkle, he would do like the inc- more more of the ancillary characters. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, like uh, Aesop and Son, like Dolls Butler would do the G Pops, which is technically Elroy from Jetsons. It's that same voice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sorry, weird <laughs> voice chasing. Oh. Of- Today on it's all. Do we remember the Jetsons? I think we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I would hope. Yeah, the Jetsons, right. the Flintstones. That yeah. They kept the '50s family dynamic, but <laughs> well, I, I also hate that, um, which is sad. Because the first few seasons of both shows were good, and then after that, they started to get um, like they're adding laugh tracks of things. It's not even funny. It's like yeah. they're, they're, someone showed a clip of like George taking his shoes off and going, "Hell, honey, I'm home," and it, they just put a laugh on it. I was just like, "That's not funny." They're just trying to make it more of a sitcom than a cartoon, right? Which is sad because mm-hmm. it just it is what it is, right? But um, anyway. What would be your fav? What would you say is your favorite film? I, I mean, so it can be right either no, live action or animated. I, I am curious what your favorite animated film is in particular. Oh, you're you're evil. Okay, so so, um, <laughs> yes. so literally this this whole episode will pretty much just be like a Kevin Smith short where it's just like two three questions and then it's the whole show. <laughs> Five questions, three questions, <laughs> three questions, <laughs> um, three. You're down to one, boy. Um, uh, That's my deceive to see me. me? <laughs> Do I feel sheepish? All right, you bad boy, but no more freebies. <laughs> Favorite animated film? Uh, I'll stew with that one first because that is harder, but I feel like it could be easier. Because um, the thing is that we're in a great place where animated films are really good when they're coming out. No, no, I'm actually it's it's harder than I was expecting. Uh, I'm gonna put a pin in that. Okay. And then uh, for the best film, it it. There's no good answer for this either, but I can I have it kind of already in my head that it, it cycles between uh, three between three to five movies, which is um, it almost always is probably usually going to be uh, Untitled, the almost famous director's cut, okay, um, or just almost famous. It's I I love that movie, um, and like it, it's such a gut punch in a good way. It's such a good gut, well. Cameron Crowe is the writer director. He also did um, newer audiences may know him from We Bought a Zoo and the wonderfully not offensive Aloha um, <laughs> with Emma Stone as a Hawaiian lady. Oh, uh, she's not. Okay. Yeah, um, uh, and Bradley Cooper and Bill Murray. But uh, he also did Elizabeth Town. But the big ones that I really like are that are recent. Well, not recent, but like are more popular than Zeitgeist or Jerry Maguire and Almost Famous. Okay. Um, and if you take away the romance part of Jerry Maguire, it still is, because I think a lot of people know more of that, like You Complete Me. Yeah. If you take that out of it, like there's a good story there that that just happens to be a part of. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really, and also like there's great lines. Cameron Crowe has these great lines, like, um, jump into my nightmare the water is warm and so like when I feel pretty <laughs> shitty if I say that usually like I'm quoting Jerry Maguire and people are like well that sounds good 
come up with that yourself? Yes, I did. <laughs> did not get it from camera. Why, well, yes. Um, and then, um, so there's Almost Famous, and then I would say um, Jaws. Oh, okay. The original. Um, like, it yeah. just, like, it holds up. Like, uh, Jim, Jerome Wetzel, mm-hmm. he hadn't watched it until, like, he was, like, 22. He's never seen it. Oh. And, like, and he was just, like, a movie, and he was saying, was like, this movie's okay. And then it got to the part where the, the head pops out of the boat, screamed like a little girl. <laughs> and I was just like, that's how good Spielberg is. Like, and, he, and that was something he, sh- he shot additionally and put it in, because he's like, the audience needs another scare here. Um... And so they did. And that's what I'm saying. So, like, it's good editing, good directing. Also, like, he made the best of a bad, shitty situation, mm-hmm. which was um, the shark was supposed to work the whole time. Mm-hmm. So you were supposed to see the shark at the beginning of the movie. You supposed to see the shark in the, in, the, in the beginning, middle of the movie. And then if you look at the final product, shark doesn't show up really until, like, late at the end of the middle and then to the end. But it works. But it, and it, but it, and it works. And I think... And Spielberg, that was him taking a chance and going with his gut, with you know, mm-hmm. which which is awesome. So um, yeah, so bizarre. Uh, so so yeah, almost famous. Jaws, Goodwill Hunting. Okay. Um, I just adore that movie, and I like what it's trying to say. Um, and then I would say uh, it fluctuates too with occasionally um, Schindler's List, mm-hmm. another Spielberg movie, and then. Um, artificial intelligence because I have mommy issues so that's a great movie for that okay um, where you just really hate life and everything sorry they're, they're testing they're, sound yeah. effects in the background and, <laughs> and they're and coming Tim's through time machine <laughs> so Charlie Adler is the voice of cow and chicken and every once in a while I don't I think I unintentionally do the red guy ooh <laughs> which, oh my which, that's god not what I love that's him. from that's not what that's from Tim is actually a, a mix up of um, Rocky and Boinkle, um, mm-hmm. because I've been watching recently, it's the uh, uh, Fenwick, uh, Captain Fenwick. Oh, I say there, do right. Come over here, boy. What are you doing? And then and then you just add a little aha, uh-huh, which is from uh, Hedonism Bot, which is Maurice Lamarche. You add a little bit of that in there, like, aha, uh-huh, chop surgery in an opera. <laughs> oh, look at it. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, then, and then sometimes it comes off like Pinky, which, which when that happens, that means I'm not focusing on doing the voice and I need to work on it but sometimes the pinky will ah, ha, ha, will come narf, narf. Um, if you go further than that Wally, Love which Wally. then could answer that other the question animated film. but if you're just doing animation all together I would say it would cycle between Wally, Ratatouille and mm. Monsters Incorporated like mm. Ratatouille is a movie that you should hate by just by the concept alone because no one wants a rat near their food right and like it's about art which mm-hmm. you never expect, and it's just beautifully written. Oh, oh my God, the Iron Giant! I forgot about the Iron Giant. I feel really, you know, right. You're almost, gonna make me cry. Oh God, I know. It's almost <laughs> a near perfect movie. Monsters Incorporated, though, is just. Um, I love a, that. Movie. It's original, and like it. I mean, I don't think I can watch that and not cry, like because of Boo. Yeah. I, I can't at the end, and. Um, I've, uh, yeah. I've been seeing images circulating around the um, the wonderful web of the inters mm, yes the that, series of tubes yes uh, just these images of a of a poster of this like more adolescent girl in pink and the title underneath it just says boo no. if you remember from I think it was in the first movie there was a line between um, Mike and Sully where uh, Mike Oh yeah. Tell Sully you've been jealous of my looks since the fifth grade and Right. And it's like no, they just the best part of that movie is the end when they go to the human world. Mm-hmm. That was the best part of that I movie. I really liked that part. And I did, but there was no justification for for not in my head, like why yeah. it had to happen that way. Like they could have done I don't know. That mm-hmm. that my writer brain kicks in when I watch that. Like when I get frustrated, that's usually because I was like I you know anyone could have made that movie better than the way it turned out. Yeah. Or, or also with Randall, like, I didn't like that they made Randall somewhat sympathetic. Like, sometimes you don't need a villain to be sympathetic. You right. mean... They don't, they don't need some kind of sob story to explain right. why they're evil. Right. And also, it makes you kind of dislike Mike and Sully a little bit because right. of that. And, or, or not to accept that they had any part in that. Yeah. Now, if they cover that in Monsters at Work, that would be interesting to do. But um, I will give... Uh, Andrew, what's his name, credit for always doing Finding Dory in that it was a sequel, not a prequel, because mm-hmm. I was like, even on its own merits, it held up for what it was. Maybe not as good, 
but um, I definitely didn't like it as much as Finding Nemo, right. and I did think that I like I liked the movie as a whole. It's entertaining. It's yeah. wholesome. It's a good movie, but. They did not waste any time getting into, oh, I need to find my parents, and blah, blah, blah. Oh, well, right. Like, and, and it's like, in Finding Nemo, they had a good, like, true kind of story build up to the part where Marlon has to go off now, and find Nemo. I agree with that. Do you think it's because, though, that you're already in the world? Because they kind of do something similar in Monsters, in Monsters University. Yeah. They don't really waste any time. They, you kind of hit the ground running. Right. Do you think it's well, because of that? Well, what they could do is, like... I don't know, just establish more of, like, what their life has become since the first I'll movie. I'll go with that one. Yeah, like, are they a family union officially? Yeah, like, are or Marlon like, and like, Dory together? Or, if they're not, or, or are they, is it like she's a neighbor and, right. you know, I hate to say it this way um, without being offensive, but is she the uh, the next door neighbor that he you have to constantly, like, take care of, too? Right. Kind of thing. Um, but she's also, like, a babysitter to, you know. But, because, again... Um, and I think this is the point of that movie too and the first one like family comes in all sizes it, it's not and shapes and, and forms, shapes and and forms and, yeah it, I mean it's not as the, the biggest theme of the movie but but now see even with that problem aside I mm-hmm. still give Andrew Stanton um, that's his name uh, I give him huge credit for doing that mm-hmm. I feel like Pixar just wanted a sequel so bad they just did right. Monsters University and, and that's why I'm just like mm-hmm. Or, like, maybe this is sad, but maybe have a reason why they, the whole movie happens is that it's a retelling. At the end of the movie, it's a retelling because she passed away. The, the dean passed away, and they're telling a story of how they got to there. Like, mm. I didn't... You know what I mean? Because yeah. cause she's just like, you know, you guys were really good, but you, I had to kick you out. And I, I have said, to do what I, I have, have to do. do, what I have to but, do. but, yeah, and I'm just don't like... Don't sell yourself short. Right, and also, it makes me upset, too, because it's like Mike and Sully in the first movie made it appear they worked really hard to get where they were, mm-hmm. and they're really smart. I just feel like they wouldn't get kicked out of school, or, or, or it doesn't matter. The, the point is, like, that's what's frustrating right. about that one, and I will always... So that's why, like, I'm trepidatious about Monsters at Work. Yeah. Um, and even if it sucks, I'll just be like, but at least you tried. Yeah. If you're going to do a sequel, you, and also it's a TV show, so they can make it whatever. Because I think there's a lot to play with in that. With Because um, do you play Kingdom Hearts? I've not really played so much as I've observed it. People playing. <laughs> yeah. So the third one, they have the Monsters Universe world in yes. there. And that's one of the things is it takes place, like, I think a few weeks after the first movie. Mm-hmm. So, but you're in, the, so they're slowly still turning it to. Monsters Incorporated to uh, Monsters Incorporated to Monsters at Work or whatever like they're they're changing it to that okay. so there are still some signs that say Scream Floor they're trying to change it to a Laugh Floor mm-hmm. you know like they're they're working on it they're like, still yeah. um, and, in the process of right and they're still finding uh, canisters like how, what do they do with the canisters with all the, the screams they have the power of the whole world right what do, they, what do you do with that after that's done I was like that's a fascinating concept like I would like to Here's mm-hmm. the thing, we might not even do it, but there's a lot you can play with. So Right. Um, so, yeah. Uh, one question that I did think of yeah. while we were uh, talking here was, um, I know you're a big Godzilla fan. Mm-hmm. You gonna go see the new one? Uh, I, I've, I've... My wife is not a Godzilla fan. Like, the first one when she's like, the Godzilla was cool. The fight was cool. The 2014 yeah, one? Yeah, the 2014 oh, one. Oh, God. She I hasn't seen any of the other ones. Not really. Like, she knows who Godzilla is, and that's it. Yeah. And then we, the 2014 movie, she's like, I liked it when he breathed fire and he ripped those things apart. And I was like, that's everyone's favorite part. Right. But, but the big complaint is, and it's not an invalid complaint, is, um, so the director, Gareth Edwards, was going like Jaws, but he did it for budgetary reasons, mm-hmm. um, which is don't show the monster. And also let's get that bad taste out of your mouth from the Matthew Broderick version. So build up to him being more majestic and... An ironic story badass. since you just said that. Um, yeah. I watched the 2014 one with my dad mm-hmm. who introduced me to Godzilla. Like, the first Godzilla film I ever saw was Godzilla 2000 with him. Oh, and that's, and that's actually a decent movie. Yeah, it was a good movie and I was just, like, blown away. I was, like, nine years old when I went to see that. Oh, I'm old. So, like... To, <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, uh, I was, like, 18 when that came out. Yeah. Or so. Anyway, yes, I, I, am, I am but a youngling. <laughs> I went and saw the 2014 one with my dad yeah. and my uncle, and I was, like, like biting my nails watching it with him, like, oh, my God, like, he's going to love it. This is going to be great. And we got out of the movie, and I asked him, so what would you think of it? He's like, I mean, it was okay, but I liked the 1997 one better. Dean Devlin, who wrote Independence Day and then directed it with Roland Emmerich, or he wrote it with Roland Emmerich and Roland Emmerich directed it. Um, it's actually, if I remember correctly, after that movie came out, Centropolis Entertainment kind of broke up. 
Mm. And Dean was a huge fan of Godzilla, mm -hmm. and Roland was not. And I was like, if you watch that movie, it feels like Roland Emmerich's movie. Which it, which it does. It feels like Day After Tomorrow and whatever. And there's nothing wrong yeah. with that. Those are really good serviceable action films. Right. Um, but if you're a Godzilla fan, you're like, that's not really... Yeah. Like, I, did you watch the beginning of Godzilla vs. The Thing? It's like, oh, because he comes up from the earth, he must burrow now? Like, which, <laughs> that's really just... I don't... They don't really explain that. But I just think it's like, what's a cool way we can make Godzilla show up in the movie? He's done five of these now. Yeah. And the water bubbles and he appears. How can we not do the bubble? And it's like... We'll put him underground. All right. But, and, but, but he, never again does he do that. <laughs> but so, but, but, but that, that's anyway. okay, though. No, here's the thing. I liked it a lot, and I was so, super excited back then because I was like, people are going to love Godzilla now. But you no, know, the 2014 version, the director, Gareth Edwards, said like that was the reason why he didn't show him until the end. And so, even though the, and the human stuff sucks, like that's a genuine. Well, that's an all Godzilla well, movie. Yeah. You watch it for but, the but, Yeah, you don't watch it for the people. The people are just there yeah. to. To say, let them fight. Right. Well, and here's the thing, too. So my point to bring this up in terms of the new one, uh, Godzilla, King of the Monsters, is... So I watched In Front of Shazam, the five-minute preview, which is literally like a two-minute trailer at the end of it, and it's like one whole like scene truncated down a little bit. It's the Ghidorah waking up. And like literally, it's just like pure monster rising up, and then Godzilla shows up to fight him. I'm like, what? It's that shot from the trailer where it looks like a... a, a, like a, 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 a What's the Street Fighter game mm -hmm. where it's like Godzilla's on one end, on the right end of the screen, and Ghidorah's on the left hand screen? It's like a beautiful wide shot. Yeah. And it, you're just waiting for someone to go, fight? And, then, <laughs> and, and but, but then it cuts away, and then the trailer kicks in. And you're just like, oh. But, yeah. And then I. So if Godzilla just, and the monsters only show up for, I think, nine to ten minutes in the first movie, mm -hmm. I, we're not going to have that problem this one. Which, I, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Honest, like, I was super excited. If we're being honest, I actually liked that about the 2014 one. Oh, because, I did too. Because there are so many movies nowadays that they just show so much of the monster to the point where by the end of the film you're just desensitized to it. That's true too. And so, you know, yeah, that I, they could have made some of the human stuff more, more entertaining to get you to that mm -hmm. point. But I remember when in the Hawaii attack, it's a beautiful sequence. Godzilla oh, comes yeah. on board on Hawaii to fight the to find the Muto, and when you finally Just do the shot, the up. pan up, the audience went nuts. Oh, and and I, and even I, and then they cut away to the Just little boy watching that, on gave me CNN. A semi. Right, so you send the Woody, right? <laughs> and so you watch it, but then you then they cut away to the kid. And it's like. Mommy, mommy, look at the TV. Dinosaur. Oh, dinosaur. Or, and, and then you then you see Godzilla, and you're just like, no, 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 come back, come back. Right. So then by the time you get to that, for me, when you get to that final moment, right. it was just like, oh, yeah. Because is it right? Because isn't <laughs> it the first rule, when he gets on San Francisco Bay, that's where they do that shot where you see the clouds, and you see, da 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 and you see, like, the, the tail swipe through the darkness. You see the shadow. Yeah. And I was just like, I mean, you see him swimming to get to there. Right. But I was like, oh, he yeah. rips open their mouth and just, just breathes <laughs> fire into it. Like, it's so that funny. was just beautiful. That and, oh, I loved how he killed the, the male. Yeah. Just the. Right. <laughs> Which, and here's the thing only one other villain that I'm aware of has died that way in, God, in the Godzilla Japanese universe. Oh, yeah? It's Gino, Godzilla in name only, which is the 97 oh. Godzilla movie. <laughs> um, when In Godzilla Final Wars, the aliens send a bunch of monsters. They capture all the monsters and, and mm -hmm. a bunch of space ones. They just send them after Godzilla because he's on his own side, but like the human race is just like, we can put him in path of the other monsters and let him kill them all right. or defeat them. And so they do. It's really hokey. The human stuff's really hokey. It's like the Matrix on comedy crack. But I'm so uh, yes, I am super excited for that movie. Oh. Like literally, my wife is like, "Dear God, you would almost think that we came here just for the five minute preview." I was like, because I really wanted to see Shazam, but I was <laughs> like, "Well, yeah." <laughs> yeah, um, Jessica uh, Jessica Gibson, who uh, plays Admiral Janko on a Universe Journey, and for mm -hmm. its all she was with us too, and we were both like, "This is the best thing ever," <laughs> and I would agree with that. Random ass question. What's your favorite Pokemon? Ooh, ooh. Well, I am a fan of dragons, so yeah. Indeed. Uh, Charizard's up there, but no, 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 no. My favorite. Nay, 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 nay. Nay, uh, nay correct. Nay. My favorite Pokemon is. Bumblebee tuna. No, it's uh, sorry. I don't know why that pops in there. 
<laughs> it's like that'd be a great name for for a Pokemon. Oh yeah, it's like Gen Eight, man. Gen Bum- Eight, Bum- Bumblebee Tuna. I choose you. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, no, it's gonna be Bulbasaur. I just love that little guy. I don't know why. Um, I, I think what episodes I did he, watch. He doesn't get show. enough love. <sighs> he kind of doesn't. It makes me sad. It makes me sad as well. No, right. Like everyone goes, oh, Pikachu or Charizard or even Squirtle. And it's like, you know what? <laughs> Screw <laughs> you. <laughs> little, that, little, that little ball of plant. He just. He's balls. doing his best. He's doing his best. And so that's it. Yeah. Like, I, I, I think of all the episodes, it's always the one I was just like, because I didn't watch a lot of the episodes, but I would just be like, Bulbasaur seems like he's actually a, outside of Pikachu a well-developed Pokemon character that Ash owns like <laughs> yeah. he's, and, until they just stop using him as much right. and, and you're just like and so yeah I love Bulbasaur so if I ever play the games which I don't play it often um, I always will get I always try to get Bulbasaur and I always so in Pokemon Go even though I don't play it anymore mm-hmm. um my Pokemon that I chose was Bulbasaur, and I always just try to build him up, 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 and then I couldn't find any more Bulbasaur, so I can't give him any more gum to, to whatever. You and can't feed him the flesh of his own kind anymore. <laughs> I, right, isn't that creepy? Where do you people think those candies come from? Pepita. Pepita. All right. Well, I think yep. that is the time for us to wrap up. Thank you, Dan. We just ended with a handshake, everybody. Yes. It was a strong, on, firm strong handshake. Firm. Yes, man. It's a manly, manly shake. Man yes, shake. Man shake. It's all been done, Radiar, number 187. Meet the cast, number 28, When Nick Met Dan, part two. It starred Nick Argenbright and Dan Kondo as themselves. They hosted themselves, they narrated themselves, they did everything. So I guess I don't need to run down all the other show parts this week. Just uh, enjoy getting out early. It's like like when the class ends early and you get to, to that extra couple of minutes of your life back. Have a great week. Just to clarify, I'll start. Uh, apparently, uh, last time uh, I, I talked too much and didn't give Dan any time to ask me questions. <laughs> so we're, I'm sorry. We're I didn't back know that again. was even part of it. <laughs> Oh, I mean, that, was kind of, that was kind of the same last time we were just it's okay. babbling on. It's, it's, it's totally cool. It's, it's totally okay. cool. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Okay, then, James <laughs> William <laughs> Bottom Tooth. <laughs> okay, so one of my. Th- this is the show, folks. This is the show. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Chris, you're going to edit that shit out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice, and edit it out. Yeah, thank you, Chris. <laughs> this should be an outtake they put at the end. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 anyway. It's All Been Done presents... Who's got the time?